Welcome, everyone. The summit is now live. Tracy, please take it away. Thank you so much. And I'd like to welcome everybody to today's event, the Enterprise Cloud Data Summit, Why Securing and Managing Your Cloud Data is the Future of Your Enterprise. This is Tracy Cook with Virtualization and Cloud Review, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us. You're in for a real special program today. Uh, the event is sponsored by Nutanix, and we're grateful to them for making this event possible. The event features three sessions with content provided by our editors and handpicked industry experts. Each session includes a presentation followed by a Q&A session, and you can see the agenda in the resource tab on your console. Before we begin, let me take care of a few housekeeping details. This event is being recorded and will be available in a few hours by logging back in to the link you're using now. You can, you can take a look at that time. As I mentioned earlier, we'll host a Q&A session after each presentation. Be sure to take this opportunity to get your questions answered by our experts. And finally, Nutanix has provided a couple of resources that you can be found on your console. So please take a look. And now I'd like to welcome Scott Becker, Editorial Director for Virtualization and Cloud Review. Scott will be moderating our first session entitled The New Cloud Data Model. It should be an interesting session and a great way to start the day. So now I'd like to pass it over to Scott. Scott, please take it away. Thank you, Tracy, and welcome, everyone. I'm so pleased to be here. So our, our first speaker today is Howard M. Cohen. And Howard is the senior resultant with the Tech Channel Partners Results Group. Howard is a, a regular at our summits and always provides a wealth of information. He's a 35-plus year executive veteran of the information technology industry who today writes for and about uh, the IT channel and industry. He's a frequent speaker at IT industry events that include Microsoft Inspire, Citrix Synergy Summit, ConnectWise, IT Nation, uh, Channel Pro Forums, Cloud Partners Summit, um, and uh, CompTIA Channel Con. Frequently helps and presents webinars for many vendors and publications. And with that, Howard, welcome. Thank you, Scott. I, I love how you emphasize the plus in 35 plus years. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, seriously, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I want to thank you for being here. Uh, second, I hope you've all eaten because in a second you're going to get real hungry because the first point I'm going to make is that data is the new bacon. That was actually said and requoted a thousand times in various publications, so I don't know who said it first. Um, but data has been said to be the new bacon, everybody's favorite. Everybody loves it. And uh, other people have suggested that data is the new oil. Uh, very, very valuable. Everybody wants it. Everybody needs it. Um, no matter what you compare it to, data is clearly the new most valuable asset any company owns. Um, without your data, you really can't do business in today's market. And we'll be exploring a bit of that and how we manage it in the course of this session. Most people up until recently, a couple of years ago, kept all their data in their data center. Over the past few years, many, maybe even most, have moved their data to the cloud. Looks easy, right? It's not. Um, the one mistake people have made <clears throat> consistently is to think it's easy to move your data from on-prem to the cloud. It's not impossible, it's not difficult. It just requires that you approach it with a plan. Um, first of all, the data may have to be optimized for use in the cloud. You may have to recode certain applications or at least adapt them to, uh, adapt them to be uh, working in a, a cloud environment with cloud software. Uh, it's different, and so you need to assess your data assets, assess your workflows, assess your workloads, and move it carefully. Once you've moved it, you have to assure availability. 
Um, you have to ensure that everybody can reach it. That's one of the reasons you put it in the cloud, so that everybody could reach it easily. You need to make sure it's secure, and most people think that's much harder in the cloud, and it's not. Um, so we'll, we'll explore that a bit today, too. And you have to ensure data integrity. That is to say, you can't lose the data. If a drive goes down, it can't take data with it. Um, if a hacker in, in, invades you, they can't get away with your data. You have to protect it, and you have to be able to restore it if something goes wrong. Um, so we'll talk about data, uh, data recovery, disaster recovery, in the course of this session. I'd like to introduce you to a happy user. Why is she happy? Um, she's happy because she just finished a project and she has sent off her, her an email to her client telling them, here's the, here's the document that I needed to finish for you. It's here. I know you needed it this morning. Um, so here it is on time. And that makes her so cheerful, so happy that she decides, oh, I'm going to go out shopping at Whole Foods. Um, okay, so she goes shopping. While she's uh, exploring the bulk storage, just a little data joke there, uh, an email comes in, and she gets it on her smartphone, which she always has this guy walking around with her to carry for her. Unfortunately, the smartphone message is that, well, thank you for your email this morning, but there was no attachment. Um, we don't know what to do. Uh, and here she is, about an hour's drive from home at, at Whole Foods. They needed it two hours ago. She can't keep them waiting. Luckily, she has the cloud, and that's where all her data is. So what does she do? From Whole Foods, she sends a, a request to the cloud to send that document to her client. That's it. Simple. He gets the document. As you can see, he's cheerful. And everything continues along swimmingly. The fact of the matter is, it didn't have to happen from her smartphone. It could have happened from a laptop, a tablet, her wristwatch. Data in the cloud is accessible to all of these devices, as well as the billions upon billions of devices in the cloud, in the Internet of Things. So all of these things share data, move data around on a regular basis uh, between them. This is all very, very good. Now, they didn't have to be at Whole Foods either. They might have been in a hotel room of working. They might have been at an airport waiting for a flight. They might have been in a classroom taking a class. They might have been <laughs> on the beach. And they could have been anywhere, literally anywhere. Wherever you go, you should be able to reach your data from wherever that is. Some of the advantages, well, the big one is auto-sync or replication. Um, the fact that the data that is in the cloud can also be resident on your device locally. And whenever you make a change on your device, it automatically replicates to the cloud. So you always have a current copy in the cloud, which means that when you put it up there on one device and get it back from there on another device, it's the current copy. And that is what has made all of this possible. All files are available to all devices, and I should have added at any time. Um, fantastic. Um, for those of you who travel a lot, you'll remember the old days when you used to take a passport drive, plug it into your USB port, and copy all your files over um, so that you could bring them with you because there wasn't enough room on your laptop. Um, and then you realize you forgot one, you couldn't do anything about it. That's no longer necessary. Wherever you're going to be, you simply log into the Internet and get the files you need when you need them, which is especially easy because now many cloud services don't bother putting the entire file on your local device. They simply send a pointer, which is 
less than 1K. I mean, it's really tiny. So you can carry all your files on your machine. It's just that you need to be attached to the Internet to actually pull them down when you click on them. You can also move big files more easily by simply putting them up in the cloud and sending a link to them, to your recipient. No more will you hear, oh, that your file was too big for our mailbox. And it happens. And send a link. By the way, when you get your next laptop, you may want to spend less on storage and more on processor, memory, all the other good stuff, because you don't need much. My current laptop is 128 gig. Um, I don't need much. I have all my pointers there. If I need a file, I just connect to the internet and I pull it down from the cloud. So all good things. What does this mean? What it really means is that we've gained tremendous data portability or data agility, if you want to call it that. Um, we have the ability to move data wherever we need it to be, whenever we need it to be there, either to ourselves or to other clients or to anybody. And this is important because we need to remember that data only makes money when it's in motion. Think about it. If your data is sitting in storage, what's that doing? When you sell a, a data entity to a client, like a database, that makes money. When you allow a client use of your data, you get to charge them for that. You know, only when the data is actually working, in motion, from place to place, does it actually make money for you. So we want to be able to move data anywhere we want, anytime we want, but we want to make sure that we move the data safely. Incredibly important that the data be moved safely with you know, high security. Now, what are the implications of that? Well, to, to start focusing in on the implications, let's take a look at one of the government regulatory acts that most everybody's familiar with. I'm talking about HIPAA. Most people, not most people, many people spell this H-I-P-P-A because we all grew up knowing about the hippopotamus, so that must be how it's spelled, um, but that's not correct. HIPAA is an acronym, but what it stands for is the Health Information Portability and Accountability Act from the Department of Health and Human Services, HHS. So Health Information Portability and Accountability. We want to be able to move the data in an accountable, responsible fashion. So let's focus in on that. Let's focus in on portability in an accountable context. We've already talked to some degree about portability, how the cloud makes data portable. Let's focus now on accountability. How do we make sure that we are accountable? And the beginning of that comes from cloud data management and disaster recovery. Many of the disaster recovery providers, and there are many, um, are now moving from calling their software, data recovery software, disaster recovery software, and calling it data management software instead because it goes beyond disaster recovery. It really goes to putting the data where it most needs to be for a variety of reasons. Um, the challenges, though, um, are many. There are several, and I'm going to go through them with you. Um, but they're making this more challenging than ever. I mean, the first one, the one that is probably most obvious to everybody, is the amount of data that we're storing. Uh, you've probably all read the stories about how in two years we produced as much data as had been produced since the recorded history of time. Uh, that, that, that's a good way to look at it. I mean, that's happening on a more regular basis now. We are, we went from kilobytes to megabytes to gigabytes to terabytes. Now some people are managing petabytes. Soon we'll be at exabytes, and then we'll get to zettabytes, and finally yottabytes. Uh, and I don't know what we'll do after that, but it's a ton. I mean, it's an inconceivable amount of data that we are managing in the cloud today. At the same time, even though there's more of it to manage, the businesses that are using it are betting their business on it. 
So they need hot, better performance than they've ever had before. They need to make sure that their data is protected from attack, uh, from being corrupted, from being stolen. They need to make sure their data is safe. With that big a volume of data, you can't make a traditional backup anymore, at least not overnight when most people did it. People tried to do it between working shifts. So from 6 p.m. in the evening to maybe 6 a.m. in the morning, 12 hours, there are, some, there are many backups that will take well more than 12 hours to actually occur. So how do you do it? Well, obviously we all do incremental backups. We only back up what has changed. <clears throat> but how long is it before even that becomes difficult? So that's a challenge that we are facing in many ways and continuing to find new ways to chase. The other thing that's challenging is that many people are working in a hybrid environment. As a matter of fact, I would venture to say that with very few exceptions, almost everybody is hybrid. Almost everybody. Almost everybody still has something on-prem, and they're using cloud. And if they're using cloud, maybe some of them are using private cloud, maybe some of them are using public cloud, and maybe some of them are using both. So each of those has a different schema for data protection. Um, most of us have different platforms, different software products that we use to protect the data in each of those environments. I don't know about you, but I prefer one single pane of glass, one console from which I can see all of my data assets and what is their current condition and is their security active and so forth. So. The fact that it's hybrid mixes it up a bit, makes it confusing and difficult for IT managers, especially storage managers, to manage. There are a few more uh, issues. Complexity. Um, as I just mentioned, actually, the, the first example of that is that you have multiple different tools that you're using for multiple different reasons. Uh, more complexity, the way that applications interact. Um, you never know how they're going to behave with each other because they all have different protocols. They all have different ways of securing their, their, their data centers. Um, so you've got to be conscious of that. You have to be able to figure it out. That complexity is, believe me, no fun. Cost. <laughs> yes, it costs more to store more data. Now, the good news is that most cloud providers, I venture to say all cloud providers, continue reducing their prices due to competitive pressure. Um, there are more than one big one. There are five or six really big cloud providers, and they're constantly competing with each other, and your benefit, you're the beneficiary because your cost comes down. But lower cost with higher volume, your actual spend may very well increase, and that's something you need to be concerned about. Um, we talk about more complex data protection. Yeah, more and more people are assigning it to the cloud, but there's still a major proportion of people who just don't trust security to anywhere but their own control. And so they're buying all kinds of sophisticated hardware and software, and again, very costly. Another issue, <laughs> and you've probably all got people who do this, proliferating copies. Whenever anybody does anything with a data file, they feel the need to make a copy. Maybe a version change and then they don't want to use versioning. Uh, maybe they made an edit and they want to keep what they had. There's only one edit, it's not even a new version. Um, there's various reasons people do that, but what you end up having is tons of, anybody who's ever deduped and looked at the dedupe report, you know what I'm talking about. Users love to make copies. They feel safe when they make copies. So you get a proliferation. You've also got data backup solutions that are making snapshots and all kinds of temporary provisions. So you've got to really be careful of the useless copies that are sitting out there on your storage and how to get rid of them and protect yourself. The other thing that figures into this is the issue of regu regulatory compliance and data governance. Now, this is not necessarily um, something you manage digitally on your network, 
this may be the management of people um, and the things they do. We'll get a little bit more into that shortly. But being compliant with regulations is a challenge. Observing your own data governance rules and making sure everybody else does is a challenge. The biggest trends we see um, in terms of achieving modernization of cloud data storage, number one, application-centric protection. More and more people realize, you know, those of us who've been in the IT industry for a few decades started out knowing that the application is everything. If you don't have the application, you can't do the work. The other element of that, of course, is the data. With the application and the data, you can do a job. And so more and more of schema are becoming application-centric. Let's make sure the application is secured and protected, and everything else will fall in behind it. Still remains to be proved. Automation. Anybody and everybody who is growing a data center is implementing more and more automation to do it. Automation is the only way to make many things faster, to uh, bring down the level of errors, because people may make mistakes. Machines tend not to. Um, so automation has become more and more important. And there are things that now have to happen, as Bill Gates would say, at the speed of thought. Um, really, it's artificial thought that he was talking about. And but once again, a reminder, copy data management. Um, if you can stop them from copying, God bless you. I don't know how you did it. But it will help you um, protect yourself from storage overruns, all, all manner of malfeasance. Okay, I mentioned that we would get back to, uh, to data governance. Data governance, by definition, is basically what you own. You know, what data assets do you actually own? What's the inventory of data assets? Um, the tricky part is assigning a value to each of them so that you know the value of your data. How may people use each of those data assets? There are rules. And again, people have to follow those rules. And if they don't, which is, won't be surprising, there's got to be a way of catching that and enforcing it. How each data asset is managed. We talked before about data management and disaster recovery. Each data entity is going to be managed. You're going to decide where it's stored. You're going to decide when it's backed up. Uh, you're going to decide how it's protected. There's all, you know, it's not worth spending more on protecting a data asset than the data asset itself is worth. And in many cases, you choose to use a less expensive approach to certain data assets because if you lose them, you can rebuild them or it's not that great a loss. Uh, this is a way of bringing your overall operating cost down. And so it becomes important. You heard the phrase single source of truth. With all these copies flying around, you do need to be able to maintain an authoritative version, the version that is the single source of truth. And in your governance, you decide what that is and how you're going to maintain it, how you're going to preserve it and protect it, even from your own users. So that's key. And of course, talking about that, you need to carefully identify who has access to each data entity. You don't want, for example, the creative department having access to the finance department's data. They don't need it. They have no need for it. And it's sensitive data, so the fewer hands it's in, the better. Uh, so data governance is an important issue and has become more important as we get more data entities into the cloud, more data assets into the cloud. As you see, the cloud, the cloud is really from – our perception, a limitless storage opportunity. And many people just inherently see it that way. So data is going to just proliferate, and we've seen that happen. 
Uh, so you've got to be careful to make sure that you know and you control who has access and who can see the meta properties of each data asset, who can do various operations on each data asset. You've probably also heard the term data orchestration. Now, how does data orchestration differ from data governance? Well, first of all, it really has all to do with automation. Um, how do you configure? How do you manage? And how do you coordinate the various different components of a cloud network? Where do data entities go? How do virtual machines interact with each other? Um, how do we optimize the use of virtual machines in a cluster? Uh, these are all orchestrations, uh, and you can use orchestration to make these more efficient, more cost efficient, too. Basically, the more automation you're investing into your network, the more orchestration you'll need. But that's okay, because the more orchestration you invest, the more effective your orchestration and your automation will be. This, of course, is all meant to help you. It's meant to help the people who tend to your cloud network to get their jobs done. In many cases, the automation replaces all the menial, repetitive, boring tasks that your people are currently saddled with and frees them up to do bigger, better, more important, and more valuable things. My best advice is don't make automation an add-on. If you are beginning to build a cloud center, if you are beginning to build a cloud presence, uh, start with automation. Start figuring out as you talk about what you need to have in your environment, start also talking about how will we automate these processes? What software is available? What systems, you know, what tools are available to us to automate these processes? And if you start with that from the beginning, you can then use more orchestration to have more of it work well together and free you up from those menial tasks that we talked about. Now, I'm sure when you heard that this was going to be about cloud data, the first phrase that popped into your mind was big data. Everybody thinks about big data. Uh, big data is not a function so much of having larger storage of, uh, of availability, it's not a function of suddenly we just produced more data out of nowhere. The fact is that big data is the result of a dramatic increase in our ability to collect data. Uh, think about highways. When you drive through a toll booth, that toll booth is collecting data about your vehicle so that it can pay your toll for you. That's a lot of data. When you walk into a retail establishment, it used to be that it saw you come in with its electric eye and ticked off one count and said, okay, another customer has come in. That was all. Today, everywhere you go in that store, when you look at big digital signage, it's looking back at you. It's figuring out what's your size, what's your gender, approximately how old are you? And then having that profile of you, it, tr it tracks you around the store to see what your traffic pattern is. This, this data, when you think about it, you know, thousands of points of data per customer, thousands upon thousands of customers per day, every day, every week, every month of the year, that's a ton of data. And again, it's born of the fact that we can collect it so quickly and so easily. For example, somebody somewhere is at this very instant collecting data about each of you because you have a cell phone in your pocket, a, a smartphone, and they can track you on that. It's very easy to track you on that. So you can be almost guaranteed that at any given moment in time, somebody connected to us, some piece of software sitting on your smartphone is collecting data about you. We collect a lot of data. When it comes to big data, there are five V's that help remind us of the considerations that we need to pay attention to. Volume is the first one. Let's keep the surprises. Volume is the first one, simply the, the how much data is being collected. 
um, no matter who your organization is, how much? How much data are you collecting? This is, as it says here, the defining characteristic for big data. And by the way, I apologize for the word chart. I mean, the eye chart. It's, it's you know, a lot of data. But those of you who download the deck um, may want to refer to this information, so I kept it in uh, for this purpose. Velocity. Now, velocity. What is the time between data collection and output? What does it have to be? That determines the velocity of the pipes along which it's going to travel. For example, when you're driving on a highway, the highway is collecting data about you. It's under the ground. Sensors are picking up that your car has passed over them. And that's why they can put signs up over the highway that say that um, the time to your next exit is five minutes, or a further exit is 23 minutes. Uh, you're better off taking this uh, throughway as opposed to that throughway. They can compare. Now, they can do that instantaneously, real time, which means the data pipes they're using must be massive, very fast. On the other hand, there are other environments in which you can collect the data, as you will, and as it says here, pile it up, and then later on, collate it, analyze it, derive some valuable information from it, and move, far, move on. Velocity is an issue. Today, we're seeing more and more variety, more and more different data types. Video completely revolutionized the ways in which we move data. When video became very clearly a data type that there was going to be a lot of, uh, the, the protocol RSVP, uh, Reservation Protocol, uh, al allowed networks to prioritize video over other data types. We're going to see more of that. We're going to see more controllability of which data types get priority, which ones are allowed through first, which ones are throttled down. Um, and the other variety, and this is a straightforward thing that we've all got to be concerned about. Most everybody is pretty familiar and comfortable with structured data. What is structured data? It's data in a table. Okay? If you think about your spreadsheet, you have rows and columns. The columns represent the fields of the data. The rows represent the records, each individual record. So that's very structured. That's very easy to understand, and it's very easy to manage. Today, however, we have a lot of unstructured data. Social media, all by itself, generates more unstructured data than you can imagine. Not everything is digital. Not everything is on and off, zero and one. So we need to deal with that unstructured data. And fortunately, we have seen the rise of artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, and other techniques that help us to manage that unstructured data. But we have to contend with it for what it is. And then there's veracity. Uh, especially in an environment where cybercrime is so prevalent, we have to be able to prove that the data is unharmed, unfettered, unmessed with, um, not corrupted. Uh, this is critical. And it's critical because the output of damaged data is damaged. It's not valid. And it's useless. So we must protect the veracity, and we must be constantly checking, and automation is clearly the, the key to that. Now, you notice that the slide is filled, and there are four Vs up there. Um, what's the fifth V? Hopefully it's become obvious. It's what we've been talking about throughout this entire presentation. Value. The data is all about value. Um, how much is the data worth? You want to increase the value of the data and then use the more valuable data to generate more revenue. So 
all of this contributes to building valuable data entities that can really generate plenty of revenue for you. A few other concerns that we should focus on. Data sovereignty. What is that? The fact is, especially with major cloud providers that have data centers around the world, it may be that your data ends up getting stored in another country. I happen to know that my email data is stored in Kazakhstan. Why I know that, I don't remember. But, but I did check that once and I found that out. Um, there may be countries whose laws prohibit you from using data in certain ways that are absolutely okay here, or vice versa. They may allow you to use data in ways that the United States will never let you use your data. So you may be breaking the law completely inadvertently. If you do break the law, it may be impossible for the U.S. government, for example, to subpoena your data from countries that they don't have a treaty with. So data sovereignty is not a gotcha. It's not going to destroy the world you live in, but it is going to become a concern if certain things happen. Therefore, you need to plan for it. You need to have contingencies in place so that you can respond appropriately to no matter what arises. So data sovereignty becomes a very important issue. Data security and compliance. Okay, this is probably the thing that kept people out of the cloud for the longest, security. They were afraid that you couldn't secure things in the cloud. Well, the cloud providers can afford to spend a lot more than you can, no matter how big you are. They can afford to spend a lot more, and it's part of their business proposition. If they don't protect your data, they go out of business. So you can be assured that the big cloud providers are doing due diligence to make sure they've got the best possible data security in place. The first point I want to leave you with here is that compliance and security are not the same thing. You may be fully compliant with any regulations you're affected by and not have a secure network. You may be totally secure, but that may not provide compliance. So you need to manage them separately. You need to have different teams managing them. One, I mean, compliance requires people to be doing things and to be able to document them. So you often have to just con conduct surveys of people to, uh, to make sure that you're compliant. As we talked a moment ago about thinking automation first, also think security at the same time. Okay, security exists at every layer of the seven layer model of networking. It's everywhere. Everything has to be secured. It's a chain. And if one link breaks, the entire thing is useless. And you have to think of it that way. So plan the security into every phase from the network to the data center, to the storage, and back. Once you've got it in place, you have to assure that it's constantly being monitored. And these days, there are threat hunters you can engage to go proactively looking for threats before they get near your network. Uh, clearly, you should at least have threat detection and be doing that before the data actually enters your network. And there are many ways in which you can do that. So that's critical. Make sure that if something does go wrong, you know it as soon as humanly possible. Um, again, single pane of glass. You want to be able to manage all of your security and see it in a consolidated view. You also want to be able to break out between different components, but you want to be able to get an overview uh, for upper management's sake, um, for IT management's sake, there's all kinds of reasons it's important to, to, to do that. I mentioned before that a big part of remaining compliant is people. Well, to be able to check and make sure that those people are doing what they're supposed to be doing, you need to be able to generate regulatory policy reports that show that you're complying with various things. Some people didn't put into, others are read from the actual network itself. 
once you've read them, once you know what's going on, you then need a plan to remediate anything that is out of compliance. Once you've achieved compliance, the thing you want to do <laughs> is you want to make sure you stay in compliance. Okay. The other thing that I just want to leave you with is that responsibility remains with you. What does that mean? Um, many people say, well, I'm in the cloud now. The cloud will secure my data. I don't have to worry about it. Well, you do. The reality is, yes, you have a contract with a cloud provider that they will protect your data. And if they don't, you can probably sue them. Um, you may never get reparations, but you can if you want to. The thing is, the fiduciary responsibility for the data. Remember, it's the most valuable asset you have. So the fiduciary responsibility for that data re remains with you at all times. Critical. Um, don't think that you can hand off that responsibility to a provider. Now, what does that mean? That means that you need to be sure that your data is always encrypted. Not just when it's traveling from place to place in transit, as I say here, but also when it's at rest in storage. There should never be a time when your data is not encrypted. Now, obviously, in a multi-tenant world where there's plenty of different companies sharing the same cloud server, sharing individual VMs in a cloud server, everybody worries about their data leaking to other cloud servers in the same physical server. There is no recorded event that happened. I have not been able to find a report of data leaking from one VM to another VM, but it could happen. It could be done. Even more important than that, though, there is the big invader, the most dangerous of all uh, intruders into your data, and that is government. Government may subpoena your data. Now, if you look at your cloud provider contract, they have to just turn it over, and they do. Every cloud provider will turn your data over without question and without notifying you. But if you have your data encrypted and your provider does not have the key because they don't need it, the government has to come to you to subpoena the key. You have to surrender it, but at least now you know and you can take whatever legal action is possible to defend yourself. So very critical. Uh, we're running really short on time, so I'm going to breeze quickly through software-defined storage. Uh, basically, software-defined storage happened when they took the intelligence back out of the storage devices. Way back in the beginning of com you know, popular personal computing, they decided that it was a good idea to put all the intelligence that manages the storage into the device that houses the storage. The problem with that is it was hard to update because every update required a firmware update, and firmware updates are notoriously picky. How many of you have never uttered words you wouldn't say in front of your mother when conducting a firmware update? It, it's just consistently troublesome. Then they decided, let's take it back out. Let's run it on a commodity computer. And just be able to update it and change it, modify it, configure it whenever we want to on a console. It's really simple. Software updating became easy. And so now you had much more flexibility with where everything was, how everything traveled. You could make changes on the fly if you needed to. The good news is that eliminated propri proprietary hardware or changed the word pro proprietary Ugh, proprietary out, tough, for expensive. No more expensive hardware. Just use commodity storage. You know, keep your costs down. In other words, factory defined nothing. Okay? Factory wasn't calling the shots. You are. You've got the software. You've got the hardware. They're completely separate issues. You control it all. This gives you the agility to distribute your data across your network. And, and distribute it in multiple replicates so that you can protect it. You know, most software-defined storage environments provide at least three copies of all data. Fantastic. 
you could lose three data centers and still be able to recover your data. This is much more resilient than just having everything in one monolithic box. It's also ideal support for today's microservices in containers. If we had time, I would explain that in much greater depth, but it is the new way that programming is done. It is insanely resilient because if any particular process has a problem, it just gets reinstantiated and marches on. So very powerful software. Born for the cloud, software-defined storage, born for the cloud. Another piece of the future is AI. And basically, it helps you monitor and manage your cloud data. It's actually part of the automation in many cases. It accelerates and improves analytics. It does the analytics for you, generates them far faster than you possibly could. It also automates other cloud functionality. So AI will be your friend when it comes to making a bigger, better cloud presence and capability. And again, it replaces manual operations. You no longer have to configure your storage. You no longer have to perform updates uh, to either the storage, or your compute, or network, or whatever the updates are. It, it can be taken care of for you. And best of all, it augments everything by performing those routine or repetitive tasks and taking you out of that business. All that you've heard of today are loosely coupled issues. Event-driven architecture, the way that things interact with each other so that no one is dependent upon another. If one breaks down, the others can keep on working. And an event happening in one can be, can be detected by another, and that can cue activity. You no longer need people pushing buttons. The machines themselves will be able to fire off all the things that need to happen. I mentioned microservices and containers. Each process is not crucial to the overall operation of the application. The application can keep on running happily even if something does go wrong. Software-defined storage is loosely coupled because if a drive goes down, there are other drives that replace it, and you can physically replace the drive and get that drive repaired. There's many others. Cloud itself is very loosely coupled. You can break a lot of things without bringing down the entire cloud environment. Basically, data has become your greatest asset, your, at least your most valuable asset. It can be your greatest ally in getting things done. And the most important things to do, of course, are to engage with customers, so it has become your greatest competitive weapon. The better you use your cloud data, the more aggressively you use your cloud data, the better off you'll be and the more successful your business will be. And with that, I'm a little late, but Scott, do we have any questions? <laughs> yeah, we do. Uh, great stuff, Howard. Um, let's see. So the uh, the first question that I have to ask is, is was, that, was that picture of bacon from your own stove? No. Not my big. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, it's a much more appetizing metaphor for. Uh, for wish it oil. I wish it was my bacon. Believe me. right about now. It's <laughs> breakfast time here in Arizona. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, a question we have uh, from the audience. You, you talked about orchestration, and, and we had an audience question about some best practices around automation and orchestration in this new data model. So you mentioned one, which was starting from a place of automation. Um, and any others? Well, this is you know, one of the things I've been saying a lot recently is that inspiration leads to innovation. That is to say, to be able to expand your automation, you really need to think automation. You need to constantly be asking yourself, how could we do this better? You know, this has taken me a half an hour. This has taken me 20 minutes, whatever. How do we do this better? And then start to try to figure out, well, what kind of automation could we apply? The other thing, of course, is that you need to keep in contact with the state of the, uh, the environment. <coughs> Excuse me. What other new automation tools have emerged because those also will fire off your imagination and result in great innovation. Um, 
it, automation doesn't happen by itself. People have to think of it. Okay. Um, we have another audience question. Uh, what are some of the best practices for managing new data? And, and I think that means, um, it, or, or I'm, I'm interpreting that to mean like incoming data or data created sort of in this cloud era as opposed to, you know, maybe data that you already had on premises that you're, that you're moving to the cloud. So when you've got that clean slate on data created with the idea of cloud storage first, what are, what are some best practices there? The first word that springs to mind is validation. So many data centers skip this step. They just take in the data, put it into storage, and they'll deal with it later. They'll process it later. Amazing amounts of time can be saved if you simply have a validation routine that checks the data to make sure it's in the right format, that it, can, it conforms to specific business rules governing that data, and that you don't already have that specific data. It's not a duplication of data you already have. Obviously, in transactional uh, environments, that doesn't work. But in other environments, that also saves. You don't have to dedupe later on. Um, you know, other than that, make sure that you're matching the speed of your transport to the turnaround time you need to get that data in, processed, and turned into useful information for somebody. Um, very often, that's the bottleneck, and so you want to avoid that. Okay, super. Um, we've, we've had some other questions come in that are that are more security focused. So mm. um, I think we'll we'll leave those for the you know the next session, which is uh, you know Layflow and, and John O'Neill talking about security issues in the cloud. Um, you know, so so some of those questions may be answered, um, and if if not, those questions could. We'll still have them there, so uh, so Leif and John can discuss them. But but Howard, one last one for you. You you covered a lot of ground in this in this presentation. A lot of really interesting yeah. stuff. But let's let's bring it all together. If you were to summarize the new cloud data model in a sentence or two, um, what would it be? <laughs> the first word that springs to mind is divorce. I know that's a strange <laughs> word. Um, but really, I, I think the, the, and maybe it's just modularization, which is, I like divorce better. I don't like divorce. I don't ever, don't even let my wife think that. Um, no, seriously, seriously, we're, we're coming to a point where there's no longer so much of an alignment between the device, the application, the data, the transport. I mean, each of these are separate items. Each of these are managed separately. Um, in very, in many cases, things we do couple them much more tightly together. And the, the danger in coupling is that when you couple something tightly, if one of them goes down, the other goes down with it. And that's what you don't want. You want to be able to continue functioning even though something may have gone wrong. I mean, microservices and containers. You know, microservices as opposed to monolith. Monolithic programming, the way we used to do it, everything was in one big block of code. Anything went wrong, the entire monolith came down. And everybody had to wait for somebody to figure out how to fix it. In microservices, everything that the application does exists in separate little microservices that get delivered in containers with all the assets they need to function. They can be transported anywhere in the cloud. I mean, even if you're not familiar with these terms, it sounds great, and it is great. It's incredibly flexible. It's incredibly agile. And you are incredibly protected from downtime. So that's as loosely coupled as it gets. Um, I think that we need to think about very carefully and very consistently. We need to think about, are we coupling things tighter? And when I first encountered the phrase loosely coupled, you know, I had, of course, all the things you imagine that you're not supposed to think, but I didn't really get it until I really studied microservices and containers. That was the best illustration. And I think everybody serves themselves best by always thinking about how much more loosely coupled can I make this? You know, so to me, the fact that everything is divorced from each other creates that loose coupling. The data is a thing unto itself. 
I can reach into the data from a variety of devices, a variety of applications. It's just they're not dependent on each other. And it's not in my machine so nobody else can get at it. Even if I'm the only one who does access it, I can access it from any device anywhere. That's an advantage. So in your mind, divorce the device from the application, from the data, from the tr network, from the transport. D you know, just divorce all of them from each other and think about how you can mix and match them to suit specific requirements that you have. Uh, I think that's the best way. It's been a very clarifying way for me. All right, Howard. So divorce, that's a fine place to leave it for this session. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks so much for uh, sharing your expertise with us today. You provide a lot of great stuff during our, our session. My pleasure. You always do. Yeah. And I'd also like to give a special thank you to our sponsor, Nutanix, for making this summit possible. And now I'm going to turn things back over to Tracy. Great. Thank you. That was a great session. Thank you so much for joining us, Scott and Howard. We really appreciate you being here. And now we're going to go on a short break until the top of the hour. But in the meantime, uh, the slides and the resources from Nutanix are on your console. And also, this event is also being recorded, and the replay will be available later today. So we'll be back on at about 10 a.m. Pacific for our second session of the day, Top 5 Cloud Data Security Issues in 2020. Hold tight, everybody, and we'll be right back.
Welcome back. Now we'll start session two. Well, greetings, everyone, and welcome back to our Enterprise Cloud Data Virtual Summit. My name is Leif Lowe, and I'll be your moderator for the second session today. This session is entitled Top 5 Cloud Data Security Issues in 2020. This entire event is brought to you by Virtualization and Cloud Review and is sponsored by Nutanix. So that first session did a great job setting the stage for this new model of storing and managing data in the cloud. And now we'll get into some of the security issues organizations are facing as this cloud data storage model continues to become the norm. But when it comes to your enterprise data, the three critical factors are security, integrity, and access. Is the data secure? Are you certain that it remains unchanged and uncorrupted? And do the right people have access at the right time when they need it? The focus on those three factors is a constant. And as more enterprises continue to adopt cloud-based platforms for storing and managing their corporate data, they're facing a variety of evolving threats. Distributed denial of service attacks, or DDoS attacks in particular, have really spiked this year especially with all the people working remotely during this pandemic. The number of DDoS attacks spiked in the second quarter of 2020, according to the latest Kaspersky quarterly reports. DDoS events were three times more frequent compared to second quarter last year. That's a 217% increase. And they were up 30% from the first quarter of this year. But this, this all makes it an even greater challenge for any organization to ensure continued and comprehensive data security, data integrity, and seamless data access. During this session, we'll examine five of the top cloud data security threats you have to deal with these days, and cover some best practices and technologies that can help you ensure that your cloud-based data is indeed secure. You'll learn more about DDoS attacks and how to fend those off, how to structure privileges and access controls to ensure both security and access, how to defend against potential data breaches, how misconfigured containers can present a variety of unique threats, and how to establish a program of comprehensive notifications and alerts to let you know when any threats are kind of lurking on the horizon. Our featured speaker today is John O'Neill Sr. John is the Chief Technologist for AWS Solutions. And during his more than 20 years in the IT world, He's worked as a consultant, architect, executive speaker, and author. He's authored material for Thomson Reuters Aspator Books and, exec and yeah, excuse me, and Exec Blueprints. He also develops courseware for Pluralsight. John's a frequent speaker at IT events like TechMinor, Cloud and Virtualization, Live 360, the NEOSA CIO Summit, and the Northeast Ohio Technology Summit. He's been honored as a multi-year Microsoft MVP and has also received NEOSA's CIO of the Year Award. I'd also like to point out that John is also a PADI certified IDC staff scuba diving instructor. Well, thanks for having, glad to have you back, John. It's always a pleasure to chat with you. Wonderful to be here, Leif. Thank you very much. I love when we get a chance to dive into topics together. Indeed, you yeah, dive. There's the diving metaphor again. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now before we dive into the material here, just want to remind you of a few housekeeping items. Um, if you'd like to submit a question at any time, which we strongly encourage you to do, um, you can post the question using the question field to the left of the slide window. Type your question in there and hit submit, and we'll get to as many of those as we can at the end at the end of the session. Also, want to remind you that this entire summit is indeed being recorded, so you'll be able to review this again or pass it along to share with a colleague. All right, John, let's dive into our exploration of best practices to ensure data security in the cloud. Awesome. I'm excited about this one. All right. Now, just to, to start things off and give, give a good foundation here, what are some of the fundamental steps organizations need to take to, to, to best protect their cloud-based data? What, what are some of the, the best practices and the, and the most effective technologies? Well, um, so some of the, the things that I like to, to get started with is that, uh, you know, Organizations really need to take a uh, deep dive into their threat vectors. So the, the angles or the routes that attacks come in against them. 
And usually what I find is, is when you sit down with an organization and you talk to them, they will name off the ones that for whatever reason are resonant in their, their kind of collective brain. And mm-hmm. Uh, they won't think about the others until really you kind of slow them down on that. And and the reason I say resonate in their brain is because um, you go into a different organization and you put in a group of the, uh, the IT folks and the business leaders in those guys, and, you know, they'll come up with different answers. Um, the IT folks will, will talk about, you know, hey, we, we really have to worry about our firewalls. Um, mm. We really have to worry about, you know, remote workers. We have to do this. And the business folks will say, well, we have to worry about the business, so remote workers is something we need in the pandemic era, um, unlike any time before. And, you know, the marketing folks are, you know, hey, we got to keep business coming in new ways for survival purposes and, and all these different things. And it, it really will change based on the organization and what its needs are and what its IT resources are. You know, there's a lot of IT uh, IT departments within organizations that no longer handle their security design in-house, hmm. right? So, so they outsource that. So they really don't understand the evolution of technology, right? Today's firewall versus a 10-year-old firewall. Right. It is uh, cloud resources versus yesterday's, you know, even a couple of years ago, cloud resources. The number of protections that are available in AWS and uh, Azure right now are, you know, 100 times what they were even just those couple of years ago. So keeping up with those things and understanding those technologies and how they can be used to cut off those attack vectors is key to any um, modern prevention strategy. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's certainly, I mean, the whole concept of data security has always been, you know, as you're talking about th- different priorities for the business and the IT, um, it's kind of always been a balance, you know, business wanting more access and IT wanting to, and security wanting to lock things down a little stronger. So, yeah, it's a Absolutely. tough balance to arrive at. Indeed. All right. Whoops. Long slide there. Um, now let's get into some of these uh, top five security threats, and these aren't any in any particular order. Just just the top five that are looming today. And as I mentioned in the intro, uh, DDoS attacks or distributed denial of service attacks. Have, we've seen a huge increase in those this year. What, in your experience, John? What what can organizations do to def- best defend against those types of attacks? So. Um you know, one of the, the big pushes um, in my mind for DDoS attacks right now is that threat vector equation. So threat vectors are considerably different uh, since the beginning of this year because every organization, almost every organization, mm. has had to extend their operational network to include you know, remote workers, and not just yeah. one or two, but in many organizations, it's thousands and tens of thousands. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, Microsoft issued a work-from-home order for all of Redmond. You know, that's tens of thousands of employees. That's huge. Yeah. And so now, whereas, you know, you may have only supported a subset of them being an extension of the network. Now you have these folks that are working um, full time Mm -hmm. across VPNs, which make them an extension of your network or uh, through cloud resources and all those things. So that really opens up the vectors that a uh, denial of service attack or distributed denial of service attack can take. And so, you know, um, a couple things that I wanted to mention on that is, is, this this gets into that kind of that first technology system question that you asked. So every organization has to rely on DNS, right? It's the phone book of the internet. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, unfortunately, a lot of organizations either outsource uh, hosting of their DNS or 
Um, they set up their DNF a decade ago and haven't touched it since, other than to make mm. zone changes. And the problem with both those scenarios is it really puts the IT um, folks, the IT pros, out of touch with their DNS technology. And why is that important? Well, uh, just this May, <coughs> excuse me, there was a new DNS server vulnerability identified that uh, allowed attackers to take advantage of a uh, different way of doing recursive DNS lookups. So it, it mm. literally was a legitimate request um, that would be sent to several subdomains, and they would send this to a DNS server um, that they created, so this DNS server that is malicious. And Jeez. so subdomain would then uh, basically try to uh, delegate their, or those that malicious DNS server would try and delegate that request to a large number of fake name servers uh, within the target domain, but without specifying IP address. So now the legitimate DNS query that starts uh, with all those suggested subdomains is going to do uh, legitimate server queries. And that leads to traffic uh, growing upwards of a thousand times. Oh, right? So think about that. A thousand times. That's huge, right? And the thing is, is that once that attack vector was identified, um, most of the, uh, the DNS server software providers patch their software. They released new, new um, versions. Mm -hmm. But now I get back to my original statement of if folks haven't been updating them or they rely on a outsourced provider that hasn't updated them, they're still vulnerable to this DDoS attack. Yeah. yeah. Right? And, and that's the deal with DDoS today is these attackers are just constantly working on uh, finding new vectors and exploiting them. And yeah. if yeah. we're not actively patching and and closing these new vectors, then we just wait for, for the attack to hit us. And that's the, mm -hmm. the real problem with all malware is that most of the successful attacks are against already patched attack vectors. It's just a truism. Yeah, yeah. And uh, my best advice for organizations on that is my um, motto, I didn't coin it, but, you know, I did embrace mm -hmm. it and want to make it my own, and that's the get current, stay current. Yep. yep. So, so get your software, your core software, up to date, and that includes the things that you know you, you like to think of the old uh, Ronco infomercial saying, "Set it and forget it." <laughs> uh, but uh, unfortunately, those core things like DNS, right? Yeah. That's a, a, a big one. They need to be patched. They need to be updated. Uh, right, switches right. are another one. I can't yep. tell you how many organizations I go into where. They have never updated the, the firmware running on their switches since they put it in. And half of them didn't even update it when they put it in, right? They unboxed it, plugged it in, called it a day. Um, and that means that if I put that switch in four years ago, that switch is susceptible to every exploit that's been identified and patched in the last four years. That's yeah. a big number. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. Well, yeah, the bad guys have certainly been busy, <laughs> you know, especially even even now in this in this crazy world we're living in now. I mean, the 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 threats are evolving, so the security protocols have to evolve very long with it, and hopefully a little bit ahead of it. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I read uh, I read one uh, statistic that said uh, attacks on um, social change organizations, human rights organizations mm -hmm. in the U.S. Uh, basically uh, soared 1,100 times at the end of yeah, that. Geez. Unbelievable. Right? So so basically, um, you know, uh, as protests and as, as the, the socio-related events are occurring in the country, so are DDoS attacks against the organizations involved with them. Um, yeah. In fact, that same, same article I was reading showed that uh, – the Minnesota State Information Technology Services were directly targeted by a DDoS attack. Oh, right? And then yeah. um, it was highly publicized that 
the Minneapolis police website was taken down. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's it's the reality that yeah. attackers, yeah. for many multitudes of reasons, exploit social conditions. They exploit yep. fears. Yep. They exploit, um, you know, belief systems. They exploit all of that. And, yep. you know, the uh, the... Um, the side for us is, as IT pros, unfortunately, we are uh, one against many, right? So yeah, that's, that's why sure. we do things like this. We we talk, we yep. collaborate, we get together, mm-hmm. we attend webinars, we we lead webinars, whatever it is, so yeah, that yeah. Um, we become many. Mm-hmm. And, you know, as many, hopefully we become, uh, you know, a legion that can send off the legion of attackers. Right, right. You know, power in numbers, as it were. <laughs> Absolutely. And so yeah. um, the biggest power I see in our numbers is the sharing of information, right? Mm-hmm. When an attack is identified, yeah. that information yep. is shared with the people that can patch the product. They patch the product, and then that information is shared with all the people that run the product so that it can get yep. current and stay current. And get out there. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Well, certainly access and privileges are a, are a potential threat factor as well. Um, some some cloud platforms here might be considered might configured with excessive privileges or, or have insufficient access controls. What what can enterprises do about that? Okay. So this is a, a near and dear one, and you know I didn't mention it <laughs> earlier, but. Yeah. I often start out a lot of my uh, training sessions and, and um, lectures with a query of the audience. And I ask them, of all you IT pros out there, how many of you consider yourself IT security pros? And mm-hmm. I'll get a dabble of hands up or whatever. Yeah. But everyone in the audience should be raising their hand. Yeah. If you are an IT today, you, whether you want to be or not, whether you signed up to be or not, whether it's in your job <laughs> description or not, you yeah. are an IT security professional because I assure you that when the attack comes down, right, um, it, it's kind of like the Alamo. When the yeah. attack comes, anyone that can man a wall and, and um, holster a rifle, right, man, woman, child kind of thing, yeah. is going to be put on that wall. All hands and on deck. So, <laughs> Exactly. And so it's kind of the same thing with IT, right? It doesn't yeah. matter whether we're the – the database person or the um, wa- a firewall person, the switch person, whatever, right? Um, we are all going to be called to service to defend against attacks. Mm-hmm. And so privilege management um, is probably – biggest abuse I see of lack of defense, I guess you could say. So so all of us coming together and, and not stepping up in certain areas, and the one where, where all of us IT pros don't seem to step up is in privilege management. Um, right, one example right. I can tell you that is uh, how many IT folks uh, run on their computer with local admin rights so that they don't have mm-hmm. to deal with UAC um, yeah. or how many IT pros still RDP into a server with domain admin creds to do something simple like restart a service, Mm -hmm. right? And um, it's just like the argument I've always had with software folks, and they really don't like me, but I started my career as a developer, (laughs) so I do have a little bit of background, and uh, they always want to say, oh, well, it needs admin rights. There is nothing for a single piece of software that needs admin rights because when you say it needs admin rights, you're saying I need to be able to write to every registry key in the registry. I need to be able to access every file on the file system and no single piece of software needs to do that. Right. Um, What you're really saying is, Hey, I haven't taken the time or the effort to figure out exactly what I do need to touch. So let me touch Mm -hmm. everything and we'll call (laughs) it a day. Trust me not to do anything wrong. Yeah. Um, it's kind of like the, uh, you know, you hire a gardener and they need access to the, uh, 
to the guest house yeah. um, and the front gate. Well, mm-hmm. if you want to be secure, you give them access to the guest house and the front gate. If you want to just make sure that there's no possibility that, you know, they can never not get into somewhere where they might want to get into, you give them keys to the main house and the garage and the shed mm-hmm. and everything else. But then, you know, um, don't, in my mind, don't look surprised when, you know, something ends up broken or missing that you right. can't explain. And it's not that necessarily the gardener did it, but it's that you can't rule that out either. Right, right. Yeah. So, it's like so privilege management and make, absolutely. And yeah. so privilege management says, hey, we're going to do this um, AAA thing, right? We're going to authorize, <laughs> we're going to. Uh, green access, and then we're going to account for what we've done in terms of authorization and access so that I can go back later and look and see, yeah, you know, yeah. how did they get entry and yeah, why were they giving access. Yep, yep. Um, yep. And this is really important with uh, cloud software because the cloud platforms in many cases um, kind of make it very easy to start from a grant everything and restrict later approach rather than the Mm -hmm. approach that is far more secure, which is grant minimally and then add as identified. Yep. And um, privilege access. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, And so it's the concept of least privilege Mm -hmm. and that's, that's really important with cloud resources. Uh, a great example, so I'll, I'll throw um, Azure on the, on the hook here because I work a lot mm-hmm. in there. And sure. that is, you know, say you're using um, everything from Microsoft 365, so Exchange Online, to SQL Azure, right, to Azure Active Directory, so you've got identity management in there. And you have somebody in there that has access rights to mm-hmm. – delete SQL databases when all their job is really circled around managing Azure Active Directory. It doesn't make sense, does it? It gives an opportunity yeah. right, for right. an accident or an attacker to destroy loads of stuff. Yep, yep. Yeah, I mean, if you examine just about any, any companies, um, Cloud data storage platforms. They, I'm sure they're all they're all set up with excessive privileges, you know, as opposed to not allowing enough access. You know, they're, they're kind of err on the inappropriate side. <laughs> um, Absolutely, and I mean, yeah. just in the last year, um, talking about Azure again, uh, mm. you get into Azure APP, right? Advanced Threat yep. Protection, and I, I get, uh Azure Identity Protection and these full-featured, uh, large-scale cloud systems from Microsoft that are all just designed around exactly what we're talking about today, right? Mm-hmm. Cloud security. Yeah. And Absolutely. it isn't because they were bored or or had money that they, you know, had to get rid of because it was burning a hole in their collective pocket. It's because they know that all those resources that people are picking up in the cloud to enable remote working and to enable um, agility of their business and everything else are Mm -hmm. now becoming, you know, loud targets for (laughs) the attackers. Yep, for sure, for sure. You know, and and by loud target, I mean it's always when for my entire career there's always been somebody that said, oh, well, you know, you don't see attacks against this per- program, but you see them against Windows. Uh, mm. Look, when when you own ninety percent of the market of anything, and an attacker <laughs> yeah. wants to make a splash, yep, they go for That's... you know the shotgun blast, not the right. not the uh, mile long sniper shot. Yep, exactly. And the loud target uh, so, is good. <laughs> yeah, you can't yeah. you can't just base the number of attacks on whether something is highly secure or not. Obviously, mm-hmm. it can be highly secure, and that can be a reason for the lower yeah. attacks. But you also have to factor in um, what a potential penetration would provide to the attacker. 
and you know, I mean, um, it's like a, here. I'll just show my age. Uh, some yep. people out there might remember a uh, a well loved but not very largely deployed operating system called OS two. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I remember yeah, that one. Yeah. Okay, yeah, and so um, that one was not a highly attacked uh, operating system in the early days, uh, and it really had nothing to do with um, the fact that it was, you know, light years ahead on security fronts or anything mm -hmm. else. It had to do with the fact that it was a low-value target. It was a quiet target. Yep, 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 that so, makes sense. Makes sense. So as... You know, I basically just want everybody to get in their mind that um, even if they're only using a little bit of the cloud or whatever, that, mm. you know, the cloud is becoming a large target because a loud target because attackers know more and more organizations are moving towards it. And I'm not trying to suggest that your defense is, is don't go to the cloud because that gets back into our role is to empower our organizations, not um, – hide them in a closet until they wither and die kind of thing. Right, right. That makes sense. Makes sense. All right. Well, yeah, this this whole thing is about protecting our data. But you know, data breaches and data loss are, are certain. Data leakage, too, I'd include there, are, are certainly an enduring, persistent threat. Um, how, how can organizations best prevent those or minimize those? Well, um, so there's two different vectors of, uh, of attack there, and uh -huh. uh, so two different prevention mechanisms. I, I'm I'm really going to suggest or bracing okay. mechanisms if you if you want, right? Yeah. Um, one, you you really need a playbook, right? You, you yeah. need that red book. Yeah. Like you, you see in all the old military movies where when something happens, right, the officer pulls out the key and open the drawer and pulls out the orders, the book, the thing they're going to do. And uh, you want that in advance. And what yep. that means is you you go through and you organize the high-value data within your organization. Is it financial? Is it engineering? Mm. Is it marketing? Yep. Right? Because everybody goes, oh, well, our highest-value data is our accounting. Not necessarily. If you're an engineering firm, and you've got a million dollars worth of work in engineering some new widget for a customer, yep. right? And that was breached and published across the internet. Um, you're probably done. <laughs> mm -hmm. Whereas, yep. if, if your accounting data got out there, you might have to to answer some, you know, uncomfortable questions like, "Hey, why did the the CEO get this bonus?" or you know. Why hasn't this person gotten a raise in 10 years or whatever? But those are uncomfortable questions you can answer. They're right. probably not going to put you into business. So right, exactly. Your data value is unique to you and your organization. And once you identify that, you make an appropriate run book or playbook that says, hey, if this is breached, this is how we respond. Because a lot of times the response is not just IT related. Right, the response mm -hmm. is both IT and business related. So you're going to do things from IT to cut the breach off, right? Um, slam the door shut, protect everything else that hasn't been breached, because you can't really on breach data. Yep. Every yeah, right. everybody wants to um, wants to do that. They want to say, oh well, you know, this information got out on the internet. How do I get get rid of it? Well, you don't. Okay. No, exactly. uh, and they go, well, well, what if you identify the IP where it came from? I said, that's great for prosecuting the person, but that doesn't mean that your data is going to be scrubbed. <laughs> right, right. You know, and uh, so IT slams the door shut to save what remains um, full of integrity, if you will. Yeah. And then human resources and... Um, the executive team and maybe marketing folks get involved to minimize the damage done from the exposure of the data. Yeah, hopefully that uh, that makes sense. Right, right. But, yeah, like a good comprehensive look at it for sure. Yeah, and All right. that's how I feel. You brace, right? You make sure yeah, that yeah. that playbook is is laid out for your different data 
pipes and yep. you make sure that everybody knows their role. That way, when it happens, instead of panic and disarray, it is <laughs> simply uh, something you deal with. And this is a perfect uh, analogy. When I teach my dive students, right, mm. and I teach um, any level of diving, but particularly yep. um, when I'm preparing others to become instructors or preparing, preparing them to become rescue divers, one of the things I tell them is that the difference between a emergency, an emergency, and an event is knowledge, preparation. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So when I have an air leak in my primary second stage, mm-hmm. if I've never trained for that or prepared for that, that's an emergency, and I'm you yeah. know just yeah. gonna panic and kind of deal with it, whatever I'm winging. Whereas if I know that, hey, I just reach behind me and, and um, get my second stage and shut the air off if I have a shut off valve to the, mm-hmm. to the primary second stage. And you know what I mean? I just kind of methodically yeah. go through yep. this process. Yep. Then that's just an event. It's just something that happened. Yep. It happened. You, uh, I did what I was trained to do. I moved forward. And you um, followed the plan, and, as you said. <laughs> yep. And so that's that's data breaches. And then yep. data loss, data loss is actually a bit easier for IT pros to address because mm-hmm. we can create a number of, of different technical solutions to prevent data loss or to deal with it. Yep. Um, some of my favorites are is uh, I tend to rely on a separate fabric that runs all of my uh, VMs, and and that fabric uh, contains a separate forest and domain for my identity management. And within that fabric, there is very minimal people that have access, right? It's not every IT pro. It's just a few key IT folks. And that way, even if my um, primary domain, the the domain that all my folks are using, is breached or Mm -hmm. violated, I still, the foundation upon it's what it's built is still intact, so I have quick and easy access to that to start my recovery. And then I rely on um, tiered backup strategy, right? There's the uh, the local and the remote, of course. That's been common for years. But then I also recommend everybody have a um, air gap backup, right? That air gap mm-hmm. backup has to... Uh, has to be um, within your your recovery point objective and your recovery time objective, but it can be it can be much farther out than your local or remote backup. And by being air gap, it simply means that uh, you know if you were infected with ransomware, and that happened, you know, even in the last six days, and managed to get to both your local and remote backups, your air gap backup that you have to kind of manually run and manually make sure everything's okay before you do it. Um, that gives you a further point to go and grab and put it in place. Mm-hmm. And when I say air gap, I mean it is not connected to the system except right. for when right. the backup is being made. Yep, yep, fully fully separate and secure. I like it. You got it. All right. Now, we... Um, we recently presented a, uh, an entire uh, virtual summit on, on containers. And you, you and I were certainly part of that. Um, <laughs> what, what are some of the unique threats that misconfigured containers can present? Well, um, looking at the unique threats to container and environments, mm-hmm. um, it's important to note that because containers rely on essentially images created by code, yeah, right? yeah. Um, when that code is used to build new containers, mm-hmm. you should remember that the code can have vulnerabilities like any code can. Yeah, that's true. So that's true. If, if 
again, if you're not getting current, staying current, if you're not making sure that it is patched, if you're just using, let's say you're using an image, a base image that you built six months ago, mm-hmm. there could be many identified flaws in the code that built that image, and you're just perpetuating yeah. it, right? Yeah. You're just keeping them going. Um, and that has huge implications on its own. And, you know, there's other things to take into account based on what we've already talked about. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, privilege management, right? Yep. You can yep. have uh, accounts that have been given to too many people or too much access rights within the container. And particularly if you're using an image and copying it and, and redeploying it, you're perpetuating that breadth and depth of overreach over and over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah. that's a big problem. Yeah. And of course, anything that is software based is prone to misconfiguration issues. Containers are no different. Are no different, yeah. Um, you know, it it is quite common that a misconfiguration leads to a open attack vector. Right? Mm-hmm. If you go look yep. at malware and hacks and all these things, one thing that, that uh, many of them have in common is that they didn't use a flaw, they used a misconfiguration. Right? And the difference is a flaw, it doesn't matter how we as IT pros configure the software, it was still there. Yep. Yep. A misconfiguration is that, hey, if we follow the guidelines of the manufacturer and do X, Y, and Z exactly as specified, there is no opening, then that's a misconfiguration and that's on us. The problem is, is there's very few people that have the time, resources, or luxury, you know, to learn every possible best practice recommendation for every possible product, whether it be, yeah. you know, yeah. Docker or uh, Kubernetes or Kubernetes anything or, else. Yeah. Yep. yeah. So so that's a big one. And, you know, we talked about DDoS earlier. It, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, some of our uh, um, attendees may not realize that there have been, uh, just this year, an increase in attempts to attack um, containers through yeah. DDoS. Yeah right, to oh, yeah. put DDoS attacks against a, a container. And some of them have been um, relatively successful. Now, containers tend to be easier to quickly close down those attack vectors. Mm-hmm. But, you know, um, when it's you that get attacked and that's how the knowledge becomes out there, trust me, you don't you don't necessarily feel wonderful that, yeah, I I yeah. get to close it down and not get to be taken advantage of, but your damage has already been done. Right, right. Yeah, exactly, exactly. All right. Well, certainly, you know, when considering security and, and and all this and how we're protecting things, you know, receiving notifications and alerts are, are a critical part of it. You know, you have to know what's going on. Um, what what sort of threats can kind of present themselves or be realized by by missing out on on comprehensive timely notifications and alerts so i kind of uh use a a, hopefully a (laughs) unique analogy when i discuss this with with folks and that's uh i ask you know the wives have you ever had a conversation with a husband where they're talking about something, you know, regardless of what it is. Um, mm-hmm. And you really have something else that you're kind of focusing on, and you don't really hear the details of what they're saying until they ask you a question <laughs> that you can't answer because you didn't <laughs> yep. hear the details, yeah. right? And then your face turns red, and, uh, and uh, you know, it's not so bad when it's a spouse because, you know, they'll, they'll forgive you, but maybe you're uh, – you're you're in the early dating stage, right? And um, as a uh, as a husband, I know I've been guilty of doing it with my wife, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, and she takes quite a bit of glee in 
and, and pointing it out anytime she catches me doing it. Right, right. And so it's kind of the same thing. You put in Pay all attention. these uh, the, these great uh, scenes, security, incident, event management systems, or you know, you you set up all your systems, whether they be software or hardware appliances, whatever, to mm-hmm. send alerts and do all these things. And then you get involved with other things, so you really just don't pay attention to them. Yeah, yeah. And now, all of a sudden, one of them results in a data breach or a data loss. Now, like me, when, uh, you know, I'm caught not paying attention, um, your mm-hmm. face is red, and you're uh, apologizing, and you're trying to do all these things. Well, uh, sometimes... You know, you'll get lucky and the apology is enough and you'll get a little razzing and move on. Other times, uh, it's kind of a bigger deal and, uh, you know, the the spouse gets truly upset and, you know, um, you're you're in the doghouse for a few days. Um, That can happen the same thing with work. You know, you can get held accountable, possibly even up to the point of termination for for missing an alert. So it's... Um, it's very important that not only are you setting up the alerting and logging systems, but that you're properly monitoring those. And that means you may have to assign different individuals certain responsibility for certain levels of alerts. You can't say everybody has to monitor everything. So right, they right. just can't do that, that and get their job done, right? Yeah, yeah. But you can say, hey, um, you know, Jane, you're responsible for mm-hmm. watching all of our Active Directory alerts. And yep. Joe, yep. you're on the hook for our um, exchange alerts. And, you know, Tom is going to take care of our firewall alerts. And by doing that, you, you allow them to find something that is manageable mm-hmm. and move forward. Because, yep. you know, that's another um, thing that I have. I'm full of idioms and, and that sort of thing. Uh, to, to many folks, this may, but uh, one of mine is yep. you cannot manage what you cannot measure. Right. And Absolutely. Um, so if you cannot measure the number of attacks, the number of alerts you're getting, those kind of things, then you have no possible chance of being able to manage the threats they represent. Yep. That's a great way to say it. <laughs> great way to say it for sure. All right. Well, and, and looking at these areas, these various threats that we've been discussing, um, how would you say they've, I mean, you know, the, the whole technology, technology landscape and the threat landscape has changed, but in looking at these specific threats, how, how would you say they've evolved over the recent, over recent years? And are, are any um, significantly worse than they used to be? Absolutely. Uh, Unfortunately, many of them are considerably more serious than they have been in the past because their their impact profile, as they call it, is much greater. Right. 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 So uh, TNT is devastating, but a hydrogen bomb is far more devastating. Mm. Yeah. And... um, the unfortunate reality is that uh, some of the threats, particularly against um, cloud identity, right? That's one big one that I'll single out mm-hmm. that we talk about. Yep, sure, um, sure. Are now to the level of having an impact profile to an organization's ability to accomplish their work goals mm. uh, far greater than ever before. You know, now with. Um, virtual offices and remote work and uh, globally dispersed workforces, you know, because that's not, it's not just the detail of, Hey, I've got people working from home. Yep. It's also, you know, um, well, uh, pretty much if you're from the U S right now, there's not a whole lot of EU areas that, that want us flying in and out of there. Yeah, that ain't true. That's for sure. So um, what if I am a 
you know, EU-based employee that normally travels in and out of the U.S. for work, you know, maybe once a month or maybe, uh, you know, every two weeks or whatever it is. And now Mm -hmm. I'm, um, you know, stationary in the EU. Now I'm not just working from home. I'm working from home in a different country with a different set of uh, uh, rules, right, and a different set of organizations and, um, you know, China. I, I've had yeah. uh, incidences where I've had to help support um, remote work from um, employees that are, are now in China and, and of yeah. course, can't come into the U.S. or, or go back and forth. Sure. And, yeah. you know, the Chinese government has a lot of regulations on the type of VPNs that can be used and what can be accessed. So I'm sure. you now have to um, find different ways to support them. And those different ways, if you're not careful, open up different attack vectors. Um, and so one is maybe you're using virtualization through the cloud, okay? Mm. And you have them authenticating in the cloud and you have them accessing um, virtual machines in the cloud that then have access through VPNs or whatnot into your internal resources. If you don't have proper identity protection integrated on your cloud resources, that mm-hmm. attack could be leveraged from, you know, the network that's behind that individual. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and that's what I try and tell everybody, uh, and sometimes it uh, it resonates, sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> yeah. Everything. But, um, when you connect someone from home, Mm-hmm. Depending on how you're connecting them and what device you're connecting into, you're opening up threat vectors from every other thing yeah. in their home. Yep, exactly. Exactly. And yep. um, it's important to note that really if you look at the average home, there's a number of different operating systems being used, right? I would mm-hmm. say that in uh, many homes, you would find at least Windows Apple iOS, yep. yep, and some derivation of Linux. And everybody goes, no, yeah. people don't have Linux in their home. And I'm like, really? They have refrigerators that have IoT yeah. devices yeah. that are based on Linux. Yep, yep. They have switches that are based on Linux. They have, you sure. know, um, Soho-based um, combo devices that include, uh-huh. you know, a cable bridge, modem, whatever you want to call it, a router, right. The access point are all in there, and that all uses some derivation of Linux. So Uh in many cases, I would say that if you actually went through somebody's house, they have more Linux than anything. Yeah, yeah. Depending on how many smart devices they have, yeah. Yeah, and I'm betting that most of it is rarely, if ever, patched. Yep. So, So now everything in that house, once I connect my laptop to that network, and then use that network to get a VPN connection to my work, you know, the possibility exists that yeah. a threat could traverse. Yep. And yep. so that's right. certainly evolved in the last year, right? Uh-huh. Or recent years. Yeah, definitely. Um, definitely. So, you know, you need to kind of where we started, right? Really yep. understand the threat vectors that you're facing so that yep. you can challenge them, that you can stand the line and beat them back. Yep. Get current and stay current, as you said. <laughs> you got it. All right. Now, is, and I, I, I think I know where we both stand on this one. Now, in, in looking at a, establishing a good cloud security structure, how much is really dependent on technology and how much is practices and protocols? Or, or is it truly a, a blend, a truly <laughs> supportive thing? Oh, well, um, this is one that uh, I... I often end up uh, on opposite sides with with many of my IT pro peers, huh. um, huh. and that's all right. Yeah, uh, yeah. And the the reason for that, uh, for me and my stance, is that I always, in my career, tried to remind myself that in most organizations. The organization doesn't exist because of IT. IT yeah. exists because, because of the organization. Of the organization. Sure, sure. 
So if all I do is based around IT, I can actually work against the interests of the organization Mm -hmm. and put myself out of a job in the worst case. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. You know, I mean, uh, uh, I remember in the 90s, there were a lot of IT pros that just said, don't connect to the Internet. Mm -hmm. Companies don't need the Internet, right? Right, right. They don't need that. Blah, blah, blah. And then um, as recently as, you know, 10 years ago, the, there were many security pros or, or IT security pros and IT pros that were banging the drum of don't connect to the cloud. Don't connect to the cloud. Your, your, your stuff cannot be secured in the cloud. But the thing is, is they never went and talked to the business and said, do we need the cloud to grow? Do we need it to um, increase our efficiency and decrease our cost? But guess what? If we do, then it's our job in IT to figure out how to make that happen. So yeah. this is a, a real long way of me kind of describing the, the soapbox that I like to step up on. <laughs> and um, when I when I step up on that soapbox, what I tend to tell people is, is that, if you want an approach that both protects you and protects the organization's mission, Mm -hmm. you have to balance the technology you implement with the practice, the procedure, the policy, and the protocols within your organization. Yeah, yeah. That makes perfect sense. Right? You, you, you You need to... Uh, work with the business or the organization to say, hey, we can't just let everybody um, and their brothers and sisters connect to our Wi-Fi network with any Mm -hmm. device, but we can support X, Y, and Z. Um, One I'm famous for is is I will go into an organization and I will often tell them that, hey, um, you know, you want to – limit your exposure and minimize your IT overhead, but still maintain, uh, you know, remote device work is, is right. pick Android or iOS, but not both. Right. Yep. yep. Right. And they go, what do you mean? Why can't I have both? And I said, I didn't say you couldn't have both. What I said yes. was, <laughs> if you want to minimize that IT load, and uh-huh. increase security because you're closing down vectors with right. one or the other. And yep. um, what I will often be challenged with is, well, you know, I want to be able to do this. And I said, okay, is that a business need? Uh-huh. No. Well, I want to be able to do this. That is a business need. Okay, and you can do it on Android. You can do it on iOS. There is very little... When you get down to it, and this isn't a, you know, uh, a statement meant to uh, incite riots, but <laughs> there's very little that one can accomplish business-wise that the other yeah. cannot. Right. I, right. I have yet to be proven that um, there is this big glaring hole that gives an organization a competitive advantage to using one versus the other. So my thing is, is that if I can provide the business, the organization, what they need mm-hmm. with one and not yep. have to worry about supporting the others, I just cut my support overhead way down, right? I don't have yep. to, to worry about what versions are current for both Android and iOS. I just have to worry about what's current for iOS. I don't have to worry about... Yeah. 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 I, I don't have to worry about, you know, 60 different makes and models of yeah. phones. I can yep. worry about four. Those kind of things. And those decisions, to me, help create a balance that is maintainable, that is achievable and maintainable. Yep. Sounds good. Sounds good. All right. We're running a little tight on time, so let's skip over our usual uh, final thoughts uh, wrap-up there and get right into an audience question. We had a really good one here. Um, There's a gentleman in the audience asked, what do you think about the 
possible market for like cloud security as a service. He, he calls it kind of a belt and suspenders approach to cloud security. You think that's a viable approach? Absolutely. Absolutely. Sorry. <laughs> I think that uh, uh, anything that offers a uh, belt and suspenders, a attention to detail, a mm -hmm. um, shore up uh, the defenses kind of thing is a great idea. And yep. certainly cloud security as a service is a big part of that. I mentioned like Azure AIP and ATP yeah, and those yeah. kind of things. Yep. Um, but being able to extend those to beyond just, you know, your Azure cloud resources into protecting other resources be awesome as well as, you know, being able to say maybe, hey, we're going to do some pen testing for you. We're going to analyze your vectors and lead you through that conversation and all those kind of things. Um, that's that's excellent, right? And uh, mm -hmm. I think of, uh, um, I was just reading recently on uh, on Emperor Hadrian and Hadrian's Wall and that sort of thing, right? And um, Hadrian's Wall wasn't so much about preventing massive armies from crossing and things like that. It was really about kind of saying, hey, this is our border, and what we're going to do is focusing on shoring up our borders and our internal defenses and our unification and everything else rather than going out and, and taking new ground so much. And so yeah. some yeah. of cloud security, I like to think of that same way of, hey, same model, yeah. Yeah, let's, yep. let's uh, uh, really understand and mark out our territory here and then do everything we can to shore it up, to belt and suspenders mm -hmm. approach the, the thing, right? Yeah. To have All multiple right. layers of security and redundancy. Yep. That's, that's always a great thing. Okay. All right. Well, that is about all the time we have for our session here. Thank you very much for your input and explanations, John. It's always a pleasure. And I also want to give a huge thanks to Nutanix for sponsoring this virtual summit. And we are indeed conducting a raffle for a $500 Amazon gift card. And for this session, the winner is Ryan Wright of ZO Skin Health. Ryan, we will contact you after the session here and uh, figure out how to get that card to you. Thank you very much for listening in today. And now there will be a short break before the third and final session entitled Expert Best Practices for Cloud Data Management. Now I'd like to hand it back, back to Tracy. Okay, great. Just want to thank you both uh, for your interesting discussion. You always do such a great job. And I'm just going to head us off to the break right now. And please stand by, and we'll be back shortly. Thank you, everybody.
Welcome back. And now we'll start session three. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for staying with us and joining us with, for this session, Expert Best Practices for Cloud Data Management. Before you start, I want to thank our sponsor again, Nutanix. We really appreciate them because what they're doing is they're underwriting this this entire summit, allowing us to do this. So um, we just want to thank them because it, it really shows their support for for this industry and, and people and their want to support uh, people like you and, and architects, IT professionals, and, and you know, and getting really good information out there. So thank you so much, Nutanix. We appreciate you. So, you know, I'm really thrilled to announce our speaker for today. He's one of my favorite people in the world. His name is Joey D'Antoni. He is a principal consultant at Danny Cherry and Associates Consulting. He's an architect. He is a uh, recognized VMware V expert and a Microsoft Data Platform MVP. He has more than 20 years experience working for both Fortune 500 and smaller firms. He does all of this that we're going to be talking about on day in day out basis. He writes a fantastic column if you've never read it on Redmond Mag called um, Joey on SQL Server. For example, his current one is called a deep dive inside Azure SQL Database Part Two. He works about all types of data. Um, and other issues on Redmond Mags. So go over there, check out his stuff. Make sure you follow him on Twitter at Jay Danton. And um, like I said, he knows the stuff in and out, so this should be a fantastic session. So thank you so much for being here, Joey. We appreciate it, and take it away. Thank you very much, Becky. I really appreciate the lovely introduction. Uh, this is a cool topic, because it's, it's data management really interesting in the cloud. And a lot of times people overthink it, so I kind of wanted to walk through, uh, when I was thinking about how to build this deck, I, I wanted to talk about a few real things that are kind of important uh, about data management, because it's such a wide topic, right? What do we mean? Do we mean business intelligence? Do we mean managing databases? Um, so one of the things I, I wanted to focus on too, and, and this, is a, this is a commonly given out sticker. I, I, I have seen it given out by a, a particular storage vendor who shall remain nameless, but there is no cloud. It's just someone else's computer. And I put this in this deck because I want you to think about, when you think about your cloud data paradigms, that they really are just virtual. At the end of the day, they're virtual machines. There's a lot of really cool stuff that cloud vendors do, and we'll talk about that on the next couple of slides, uh, that can help you. But it's it's also just just a VM somewhere somewhere running in a data center. Even as Becky mentioned, I, I wrote a two piece uh, story on Azure SQL Database, and I talked with the engineer. They're uh, one of the distinguished engineers at Microsoft about their, what they do and how they manage it, right? And at the end of the day, it's just a database running in a VM that's got a whole lot of really awesome automation and telemetry built about it. Uh, but in terms of thinking about your data, when you move to the cloud, you want to think about what you can take advantage of, but not overthink it. There's, you don't necessarily have to completely switch your paradigms because of the cloud. And that's one of the things we're going to talk about here is, you know, what needs to change for your cloud development and the way companies migrate to the cloud. Because typically the way companies will migrate is what we what we like to call is like a lift and shift as a or a platform change or there's a few other popular terms for this, but this is effectively when you take all your existing workloads and just move them into the cloud. Typically, is infrastructure as a service virtual machines because it's it's a real like for like migration. There's a minimal amount of change that needs to happen. You do have to typically make some network and storage changes that happen on the back end. But to your database or to your reporting system, not much changes there. But what the cloud does enable is some additional paradigms. And let's talk about that. So there are a lot of advanced technology provided by your cloud provider. And the first thing I like to talk about with data is that it's basically limitless, right? We don't have to worry about the size of our data. I mean, we do because everything costs money, uh, and that's something you always want to be concerned with. But if you need another 50 terabytes of data, you can roll it out. I remember I was working for a customer, and we were testing various storage configs, and I allocated 256 terabytes of data to a virtual machine, and it was there in like a couple of minutes. Uh, that's something that just isn't feasible in, in an on-prem world because we have like lead time to get that much storage. 
Uh, so this technology also makes a lot of complex infrastructure solutions easier to implement. So one of the things I always like to talk about is how the cloud democratizes a lot of things and makes them available to a lot smaller organizations. Um, a perfect example of this is being able to have your workload split amongst multiple data centers, whether it be to uh, provide disaster recovery or put data closer to your customers. Uh, that's before you would either had to have leased space in a data center and gone through the challenges of dealing with a vendor or if you were a larger firm, had the capital expense of building a data center in, in multiple geographies. Uh, with Azure, Amazon, and Google, uh, and even Oracle Cloud, it's very, very easy to, to do that. It's very quick and easy. However, none of this really awesome cloud technology stuff does anything to, to solve your organization's data problems or concerns. Uh, data is one of those things that's really unique. Uh, working, working with a lot of people and across industries and across, uh, across roles is something I, I enjoy as a consultant. Uh, but one thing I, I see a lot, especially amongst application developers, is not having a good understanding of your data. And I, I feel like also the data architect role has been diminished probably in the last decade or so uh, because we've, we've started moving so fast and, and data architecture and enterprise data architecture within a company uh, are something that that's hard, that doesn't really uh, align with moving quickly and, and CICD and these rapid deployments. So I think organizations have problems, uh, you know, having a master data list. And you see some solutions that aim to solve these problems. Uh, effectively, systems like Snowflake or uh, Azure Synapse Analytics or even Redshift on the, the Amazon side that are, are just giant data warehouses that will aggregate lots of data together and, and sure those are really cool and they're really powerful systems, but having that vision of, of the data within your company uh, is, is not something that you, a lot of organizations think about. And to me, it, it only gets messier in the cloud. And I'll have a few slides where I talk through that, but you end up having data in, in on-prem, you end up having data in software as a service providers, uh, you end up having data, you know, in, in, in Azure, maybe some data in Amazon, and getting all that data aligned and, and well-defined is really important. So, uh, some of the things that I find interesting uh, are some of the design patterns that are enabled by the cloud. One of the things that's really cool is you're not confined by specific hardware. This kind of ties back into my limitless storage scenario, right? Uh, if your workload vastly increases, you can you can increase uh, you can increase the size of a VM. I had a customer who recently did a and they're on a fairly basic. Uh, I'd say basic, it's pretty advanced, but they're on, uh, they're on virtual machines running in a, in a cloud provider, and they were able to double the number of CPU cores they had available to them when they, they migrated classes of virtual machines and things slowed down. Uh, with a simple reboot, they were able to double the number of CPU cores they had. That was really easy. Uh, so scale is, scale is easier. It obviously costs money. Uh, it also allows for different data tier patterns, and we're gonna talk about this, but what I mean by this is, this is more of an application design thing. So if you're an application architect or a developer, uh, a lot of times we've defaulted in the past either to you know, a NoSQL database or defaulted to a, a relational database uh, for storing all of our data. Well, you know, it might make sense to store your transactions in that relational database and, and to store your catalog in, in the document database because that, that's a more efficient use of JSON. Uh, so that's that's something that's a real benefit of the cloud because you can consume all of those things as services, right? And they're pretty small and pretty cheap, uh, especially if, if you're not needing a whole lot of processing power or a whole lot of data. Uh, so that's something else. It's also easier to implement scale-out patterns. Um, back, back when I last had a real job, <laughs> I, my last real job was uh, not consulting, was working for Comcast Cable. And when we wanted to have, you know, a load balancer in front of a, a group of web servers that we could scale out, uh, that would that was 
expensive because you had to like buy a load balancer and you had to configure things. And now with everything being kind of software defined on the networking end, it makes it a lot easier to implement those scale out patterns. And a good example of this is effectively partitioning your data across many small databases, uh, which can be much cheaper and, and, sc and scalable than just trying to store everything in one big database. Uh, you use like some mapping techniques or, or partitioning techniques, and then you load balance that, uh, and it lets you kind of scale infinitely. It's uh, a distributed systems design pattern, and I, you, if you've paid attention to IT trends and stuff, you've read a lot about microservices uh, in recent years, and this is a lot of that notion. It's implement small services, partition everything wide. Uh, it works really effectively in the cloud. And I'll say for those of you who aren't in development shops, you'll read a lot about this, but you're probably dependent on third-party applications that don't do any of that, and you're kind of stuck. Uh, and and that's that's on, honestly that's a big limit of a lot of uh, broader cloud adoption because you have. I, and I don't mean to, to crack on SAP. They do some nice stuff, but uh, like applications like SAP that are kind of legacy, and really your only notion of running them in a cloud is running them in a big giant VM. I know, I know there are VMs in both cloud providers that exist that are like 416 terabytes of RAM. Or excuse me, 12 terabytes of RAM, 416 cores, and I think those only exist for people to run SAP HANA. Uh, so. You can do a lot of cool things in the cloud, and it's something as you migrate, you should for sure be thinking about it. It shouldn't be the first thing you think about. So a colleague of mine that I've worked with extensively at Microsoft, whose name is Matthew Roach, he works on the Power BI team. He's got a series of blog posts, and I kind of stole some, some stuff from him here, uh, or some ideas anyway, uh, around building a data culture in your organization. Um, this is really kind of cloud or no cloud. This is something that's really important uh, if you want to take advantage of all the data that's available to your company. It's it's 2020, uh, for better or for worse, but build a lot of the decisions that we, we make in life now are, are data-driven. A good example of this is uh, coronavirus stuff, right? I'm I'm constantly monitoring the uh, the coronavirus statistics in my in my county to determine my risk tolerance. I'm, and I'm really, really been pretty conservative about not catching coronavirus. Uh, but when the numbers spike, I'm really even more conservative about, you know, maybe I, I won't go to the store this week and I'll order my groceries in uh, and that sort of thing. So making data-driven decisions is something that your organization kind of has to be in the habit of. And it's it's something that builds up from the from really the top down. Your your leadership uh, your leadership has to be involved. A, a good example of this, and I'm probably going to speak a little too much about Microsoft because of some of the relationships I have there. But the way SQL Server development works now, for the most part, is new features are added or enhanced based on telemetry data that they get from usage that they see both in Azure and uh, on-prem SQL Server also supplies telemetry that they look at. And they're, Microsoft is looking at feature adoption and it, as to drive feature development. So that they're literally using data to drive their business development. And it's something that has to be in your the ethos of your org. I mean, given, given Microsoft is a software company and Amazon is a very data-driven company as well, uh, those data-driven decisions are kind of essential. And this means a lot of things and a lot of scale and having, having understanding the meaning of data, having things like uh, data catalogs uh, that are in place, those are all very important tools. Uh, it's also training your, your analysts and your, your people on how to use data and how to use the data tools. So if you have a tool like Tableau or Power BI or even the best ways to work with Excel, and how to understand data sources within your org and understanding what the key data sources are. You know, if you have a data warehouse where you've consolidated all that information, uh, those are all kind of the key elements of building a data culture. And this all leads into your data architecture and kind of how you manage your data in the cloud. It's, it's something we're going to, by the way, we're going to be a little scattered on this topic because uh, there are a lot of aspects to managing cloud data, and I wanted to try to touch on all of them so you got a little bit of exposure. Uh, but having a data culture is the really, like, it, it 
brings all, all of these things together, you know, managing from all the way from having a good reporting system, maybe having a data lake to man how you manage your backups. Those, to me, uh, all encompass having a good structure. And I I say this, I've, Becky mentioned I've been working with databases for 20 years, but I've been a DBA, I've been a, a data architect, I've worked on cloud since it kind of existed. So I've seen this all over in, in different companies. and. Uh, I think this stuff is pretty accurate to what I've seen in my career. So data is spread out in many organizations. So I, I tried to come up with a nice image here, uh, and this is kind of a graph image of like a graph database. But especially in larger organizations, uh, if you're working in a large enterprise, this is absolutely the case. Uh, I see some of the company names we have here. Uh, including the UPS, uh, who's, who's one of them. Uh, I, and I've, I've met with some application engineers there. Uh, you have a lot of data. So you have probably tons of data on on-premises file shares. Uh, you might have data in cloud databases. You might have data in cloud data lakes. You surely are probably using software as a service applications like Dynamics, Salesforce, Office 365, or, or Google Apps. Uh, you might have ERP software like SAP or Dynamics on-prem or in the cloud. Bringing all of this data together to get the meaningful business information you need is really challenging. Uh, this is something that it's a lot easier to show success in a small organization. Uh, when I was, I had a prior consulting gig at a company, and the reason why they, they, were, they were trying to implement business intelligence solutions at their company was they wanted to sell the company, and they couldn't accurately value the company because they didn't have their sales data uh, in, like, one place. And it was a relatively small organization, so it was, it was fairly easy to go in and build a data warehouse and deliver that to them. But when you start talking about some of the cross-systems analysis you have to do, uh, or if you were ta even talking about the, la the last topic with security, if you're trying to to analyze uh, security data on a large scale, uh, it becomes really challenging to get that meaningful data. And this is where having some architecture folks on board on your organization that, that understand the broader data scope in your organization are important. And what they do and aim to do is, is building a data catalog that makes all these sources, all these data sources Understood. So in your data catalog, you're going to define what the data source is, what data it contains, what it's the system of record for. You're also going to define how, where that data lives, so how it's accessed. Uh, and I'm not even going to start to talk about security because that's also part of this, but it's, it, that can be a, a big challenge uh, as to how you manage access to that data. And, but that data catalog needs to be meaningful and kept up to date. Otherwise, you're, when you're building kind of reporting and business intelligence solutions, you're not going to, to be able to come up with a comprehensive picture. And, and these are things that are big, big, hairy problems. So it's not something that's easy. Uh, and especially in a large organization, it needs somebody who's, a, who's got a, a big, broad view and can, and can wear that architect hat and, and work with different teams and different business units to understand what data needs to be where and what's the most meaningful data and all those sorts of things. Another term I, I wanted to bring up is a data lake. Uh, data lakes kind of became a, a popular term uh, in the, the big data era, which I, I like to coin from about probably 2011 to 2016. Uh, there, is this, there is this time frame where, you know, Hadoop was gonna solve all the world's problems Cloud Air and Hortonworks were going to go, become the most valuable companies in IT. Uh, since then, Cloud Air and Hortonworks have merged, and I feel like uh, Hadoop has uh, has finally reached its appropriate level in, in terms of technologies we use. But data lakes can be really interesting. So when we talk about big data solutions, the the, the main difference I always like to talk about with big data is that. Um, you're generally applying a data structure or a schema, as we call it, uh, in the database world when you read the data as opposed to when you ingest the data. So when you ingest data into a database, it has to fit into a table. It has to be the right data type for those columns. Uh, otherwise, your, your insert statement's gonna fail. However, when you're building a, a data lake, you're just loading files really onto a file system. And when we talk about a cloud data lake, uh, 
like Azure Data Lake or Amazon's, uh, I'm forgetting the, the equivalent Amazon feature, uh, you're just ingesting files into a, what's known as an object store. Uh, you use another set of tooling, no matter what uh, would it be, whether it be you know a Hadoop tool like HD Insight or, or Elastic uh, Elastic Hadoop from Amazon, any or any of those text reading tools that you would use. Uh, that's where you ingest data. One of the things, that kind of from an economics perspective, that I haven't mentioned yet in terms of cloud is there. Are, Three costs, the cloud, three main costs to cloud computing, right? One is compute, so that's like the cost of the VMs you have. Two is the cost of storage, uh, and storage is relatively cheap in the cloud. So, uh, especially for data lake type storage, that's not super premium and is probably stored on a, a hard drive somewhere and, and not a solid state device. It's really cheap compared to storing on prem. And then the third cost is networking, right? So, you're um, Almost every cloud vendor has the same model where you pay, you, pay, you don't pay any d data going into the cloud, but you do pay for data coming out of the cloud, which we'll talk about in a few minutes and on, on another slide. Uh, but what that means is if we have data that kind of only lives in the cloud, so for example, if you have a mobile app that you're getting user logs from and you're, you're aggregating this, and all that data is coming from the internet anyway, it's a really good use case to put that in the cloud. And this is where data lake comes in. If you're storing, uh, if you're storing original files and you want to store a lot of them over time for, you know, whether it be data mining, you want to look at your website logs to see how people are, what kind of click streams people are doing. Uh, or if you have log data that you're analyzing for security reasons, like secure endpoint uh, monitoring, those are, those are all good solutions for a data lake. Uh, what, I saw some people do like in the kind of big data area that was a bad idea, was try to take like an existing data warehouse and move it to a data lake because it was the trendy thing to do. Uh, that's not a great idea. You're probably not gonna have as good of a user experience. The tools are a little bit harder to use. Uh, but if you're storing pretty large amounts of data, so probably you know tens of terabytes of data, it can be a really uh, effective scalable solution for, for those kinds of things. So that's where you're gonna need uh, to, to have that understanding. Uh, like I say, the, the kind of key thing here is if it's lots of data and it's cloud generated, it's a good solution. So in terms of like your cloud data strategy and, and how you get there, uh, the way migrations typically happen and, and most of the customers I've worked with anyway, and even what I've seen in some larger organizations, uh, these migrations will usually happen by application tiers. So you might move all of your SAP systems at one time because you're, you're going to want to take that adage on that one system and get it all into the cloud. Uh, where this is tricky from a data perspective is understanding all those externalities or external data relationships that you might have. Because even though you moved SAP to the cloud, you might have some reporting system that hooks into it that you're not aware of because you didn't, you didn't see it in the connection. Uh, so once again, this is kind of where having a catalog, and I, I know it's kind of an overarching thing that I keep talking about catalog and architects, but having the people that know all the systems uh, and understand those cross-application relationships. The, the last thing you want to do is break uh, is break somebody's Excel spreadsheet that's you know has a C in the, a leading C in their title uh, because they're connecting to some system. Uh, that got moved and their connection string broke. So it's important to understand those kinds of relationships and to understand your organization's reports. That's also another thing to benefit of having like a centralized reporting structure where everybody has the, the same kind of dashboard approach. Having worked in multiple enterprises, I know just about every enterprise I've worked in owns like every business intelligence tool on the market because they've, they've gotten implemented at a departmental level. Uh, except maybe Microsoft, but uh, all the other enterprises have everything. Uh, so this gets inherently messy, especially in a large organization. Uh, and you may break stuff, but we can re we can reduce the risk of this by by doing some analysis and, and moving those aligned systems together. I know, as a DBA, we've uh, we've got a lot of tricks, and one of the tricks is always to, to dump who's logged into the database using what program, and then trying to reverse engineer. 
uh, what's coming into our systems because we don't always know what's connecting. And, and in a perfect world, we do. It's, it's an application server sending prepared code. Uh, in reality, it never actually works that way. Uh, so that's just something that, uh, that we kind of think about uh, from, from a data perspective. But getting those systems that are closely aligned uh, or together is really important and will kind of ultimately save you money. Because one of the things I, I see, and I think I have another reference to this later in the deck, is customers will end up reporting, like they'll keep the reporting systems on-prem or, or you have users who are reporting in Excel and they'll pull down massive amounts of data into their Excel spreadsheet. And if you have enough of the customers doing that, uh, that can add up to a lot of money in, in terms of bandwidth costs. So that's just something to kind of pay attention to. The other, this is kind of an interesting slide, and I probably could have said a few, little, few more words in the slide, but I'll just talk because that's why I'm, I'm here. Uh, the, I mentioned this earlier. When most companies do a cloud migration, they're doing a, just a like-for-like like migration in the IaaS, so they're moving their, their systems in the VMs. Uh, they're, in general, there are... There are benefits to moving to cloud VMs. We mentioned the lower storage. They're, they're more highly available than probably the, the VMs you had on-prem or with a, another hosting provider. But there's not a lot of cost savings. Uh, there's a little bit of flexibility in that you can turn off cloud VMs maybe for your development environment. But compared to the, the platform as a service offerings, uh, where you see a lot more benefit uh, this is something that I, I see organizations kind of evolve, and typically it'll be like a, a six-month time frame. So you'll you'll do your cloud migration, you'll move all your databases, you'll move your file servers, uh, but then over time you'll – and typically this will happen too with the organization getting more familiar with the cloud. Uh, so that's uh, that's something where you're – kind of up-leveling your organization's cloud skills and seeing how there are these other services, or maybe you have new projects that, that you are building from scratch and you decide to take advantage of platform services. Because the platform services are typically where you'll see solutions like auto-scaling. You'll see solutions like uh, a lot of, and I absolutely, absolutely hate the term serverless, but Amazon started using it on their database solution, Aurora, and then Microsoft started using it with Azure SQL Database. Effectively, all serverless is in both of those scenarios is auto-pause and auto-scale. So if nobody's using your database, it will auto-pause, and you can, you can save money that way. Uh, and it's a, it's a cool feature. I just hate the name because there's always a server. But it's something that you should, you should kind of be, be aware of, uh, that you're going to – this is typically how migrations will happen, and you'll evolve a little bit into using platform as a service offerings. The corollary to this is that platform as a service offerings do kind of pretty much hook you into your cloud vendor. And there are a lot of folks out there that will say, oh, we must avoid lock-in, so we can't, uh, we, can't, we can't use this platform as a service offerings. We're moving everything to Kubernetes so we can be cross-platform. Uh, well, that's realistic for organizations that have a lot of engineering staff, and I, I think Kubernetes is an awesome platform, and I do think there's a lot of a lot of positives to it. It's not easy to run for a lot of organizations, and frankly, most organizations are going to benefit from you know if you're going to go into the cloud, uh, go in deep with your cloud vendor, and don't really worry about doing multi-cloud. There are places where it has to happen. I know like there's some regulatory environments and some financial systems where that has to happen. But take your cloud provider. You're, you're going to want to get your engineering team and your, your infrastructure staff up to speed on all the things in that cloud provider. And then you can really start to take advantage of it uh, and become kind of a mature organization in that cloud uh, rather than you know, just consuming VMs and, and storage. Because it's, it's not the most efficient way, and it's, it tends to be more expensive. So if you can start to, to consume some platform as a service offerings, a lot of times it can be helpful. And in terms of when we talk about platform as a service with databases, we or data, we mean you know things like database as a service or or data database as a service or data file share as a service. Sorry, I couldn't say that. Uh, data lake even. So data lake. I kind of left this off when I was talking about data lake. But one of the cool things about data lakes in the cloud is that 
you're just paying for the data. There's no compute associated with that data. So when you need to do data analysis, you simply spin up the compute on demand and, and use that uh, compute platform to, to do the analysis of your data. So you're not paying for the compute 24-7. So living in a hybrid world, so most organizations, even those that have migrated into the cloud fully, are still hybrid somehow. I mean, obviously you probably have users, well, I used to say you used to have, you obviously have users in an office. Usually before, before February you had users in an office, but you have users at home or you have users socially distanced in an office uh, connecting, into, uh, connecting into the cloud. Uh, in terms of like the technical stuff as to how this works, it's pretty straightforward in the way we like classically think of networking. There's a VPN connection between your, your you and your cloud provider wherever wherever you your network edge sits, and, and that can be a standard internet VPN, or you can have a direct connection to the cloud. Uh, either way, you're connected to the cloud. That cloud is an extension of your office slash data center. Uh, but data lives in a lot of places, and this is something, as you're doing a migration or if you're kind of in a permanently hybrid role, it's something you want to think about because unlike your compute costs, which are, tend to be relatively fixed, right, a, a VM costs $1,000 a month for a given size, and you know it's even, even if you hammer that VM, it's going to cost you $1,000. Networking costs can be really expensive and they can surprise customers. And I've heard a lot more about this on the Amazon side than I have the Azure uh, side. I will tell you their price very similarly. There's not a lot of difference in pricing, so I'm not sure why it's been more of a problem with uh, Amazon customers. But that downstream data migration is it can be can be really expensive. So if you have if you have a system where you have a, a database and you have users retrieving lots of records for it. Uh, into, say, Excel, and maybe not into a cloud reporting tool, uh, this can be a problematic thing. So it's something to think about uh, in how you design your architecture and manage, right? You want to think about what the right way to, to do that cloud uh, hybrid connection is. Alternatively, you can, I, I know at least with Microsoft's direct connection solution, you can pay more money to have unlimited downstream data, uh, which is, if you're if you're stuck, it's like it's a good solution, uh, but you can save that money and, and pay pay for the bandwidth. So it's a it's a trade off. So something I talked about earlier in terms of the kind of opportunities that moving to the cloud opens up for you, uh, and this is a term I've used uh, and I did not coin it. I've seen it numerous places called polyglot persistence, uh, and this is something you, if you're if you're working with a third party app or or some existing legacy app in your organization, it's not something you're going to be able to do. Uh, but this is the concept of, in your application, storing data in the best location instead of possibly potentially storing everything in a relational database like MySQL or Postgres or SQL Server. Uh, the example of this would be you put your logs into a data lake. Uh, your JSON output, maybe from your mobile app, goes into MongoDB and then your transactions go into a relational database service. To add in a couple of additional boxes, you could even have a Redis cache in front of your relational database or your MongoDB uh, so that you're not always hitting those databases. And the way to think about this is, is kind of twofold. First of all, relational databases tend to be the most expensive uh, cloud service in terms of both cost and performance. There's a lot of stuff that happens when you insert data into a database. Uh, when you write data into a data lake, you're just writing data, writing a file. So there's no transaction log management or anything like that. Uh, so big, big write scenarios like logging are going to be more efficient in a data lake or maybe even a key value store uh, than they would be writing into a database. Uh, so you're also provisioning the most cost-effective solution for each type of data. And once again, this also kind of ties back to a little bit of a microservices scenario that the the cloud kind of frees your thinking of what you can what you can implement because you don't have to worry about like to go way back if you wanted to implement these four thing three or four data solutions you would have had to have bought four servers and got the storage for those four servers even in a VM world you have to spin up four VMs and VMs have a lot of overhead 
uh, this is not this is kind of a, a cool side benefit of the cloud that it's very easy to spin up these small resources uh, that can that can provide a data data solution for a given service. So some other cloud data patterns, and I think we've talked about these in general. Uh, sharding data across multiple data stores is a big one. Uh, Joey's first rule of cloud economics is that lots of small boxes generally cost less than one really big box because uh, there's a premium for for very heavy resources that the cloud vendors consume. So if, if you can build 100 very small VMs, it's likely to be cheaper than building one that one VM that's got 412 cores and 12 terabytes of RAM. Uh, so, so th think about that, and that's something you have to think about early in your application because it's not something you can implement after the fact, really. Uh, the other thing is to take advantage of uh, platform as a service data offerings. These vastly reduce your management overhead. Uh, you don't have to worry about things like patching. Uh, you don't have to worry about security as much. Backups are typically handled for you. That'll that'll be on the next slide, uh, and it's just. That's things that I, I see with a lot of customers that are major benefits because you want to you want to make the it's cloud supposed to make your world easier and not harder. So having a backup strategy around all of your data is really important, and this isn't on the slide, but it's the most important thing I'm going to tell you. Uh, take this home. Backup strategies include restore strategies. If you can't restore your data or you haven't tested your data restoration. Uh, you don't know that you have good backups. So really understanding your backups, having a good way to test them is really important. Uh, and this is another thing that's really important to understand if you're using a PaaS service. Uh, PaaS services almost always have automatic built backup of some kind uh, in place. But, uh, but it's not necessarily the same for each service. So uh, it's important to know how long the retention is, uh, what the data loss window is. I know of like one or two services where you can potentially lose 30 minutes of data. Uh, and in a lot of cases, you have to configure the long-term retention if you need it. So if you have a regulatory requirement to keep data for however long, uh, you, may need to, you may need to do that. And storage is cheap in the cloud, so you can kind of build your own backup service, or you can take advantage of the, the cloud provided backup, the vendor provided backup services that are available in each cloud. Security. Uh, security is both easier and more challenging in the cloud. It's a lot easier to encrypt everything. Uh, it's usually one one click encryption. However, you can end up with uh, a lot of public endpoints, and it's important to have a strategy around understanding these and, and manage them. And the cloud really doesn't change your security strategy a whole lot, other than having to worry about those public endpoints. There are some additional tools that are built into the cloud around how you secure data that I think are really useful, uh, that give you best practices and give you, uh, I know in Azure you can get a security score which is kind of a handy way of doing your own audit. So to close out uh, today's talk, uh, moving your data for, to the cloud allows for a lot of changes in design patterns. It opens up a lot of doors, especially if you're a smaller org. You can do things you just couldn't do before because of the capital expenditures you would have had to have made to build that, those kind of distributed systems architectures. Uh, it can also let you get involved in pretty messy solutions. Uh, there's typically a maturity curve within organizations, so your first step is, is to move, uh, and a lot of times that occurs just into infrastructure as a service solutions, uh, and then eventually you'll evolve, kind of evolve into taking advantage of some of the higher level solutions like platform as a service or even some of the containerized service offerings. Uh, your security and backups are going to be a little bit different, but there's still very big concerns in the cloud world. And as always, I'd love you to be able to restore your data. And in the cloud, you can even automate that restoration, of, that testing of restoration. So this is another example of where you have some flexibility. You can spin up a VM, restore your backups, uh, all in an automated job, and then have it go away. Uh, very quickly, you paid for a small amount of compute. And with that, uh, 
Well, we can take some questions now, and we'll see if I, I think I see maybe one in the queue. Uh, yep, we sure do have a question for you. And, and anybody else has a question, go ahead and put that in now, and we can get Joey to take that for you. So um, the question for you, Joey, our first one is, have you considered ABAC differential access enforced by dynamic key managed cryptography at the object layer, making you indifferent to topography? Um, ANSI, <laughs> I guess ISO um, standards exist for that? Yeah, that's, that's a pretty complex question. Uh, <laughs> that, is definitely, that is definitely one approach uh, for, for managing uh, cryptography. There, there are a lot of challenges around cryptography, and I, I wonder if that was for if that was a current question, but uh, yeah, 223, so that was us. Uh, the real challenge around managing cryptography is different Different solutions have different uh, different ways of encrypting data. Like in SQL Server, I use something called Always Encrypted, and if I'm in Azure, that's super easy to implement. Uh, it's a little bit harder if I'm in Amazon. Uh, MySQL, you're kind of like on your own for how you do encryption. Uh, in terms of like just encrypting data at rest, it's very easy to do that in the cloud. You can, you can totally do dynamic key management. Uh, you can you can drive that and, and work either with the cloud provider or with that. Uh, but in terms of like encrypting data in databases, that can be that's always a little bit of a challenge because it's it's so platform specific. Okay, and with that, I want to thank everybody for being here today. We do have the winner for our um, second gift card, and I am. Not going to pronounce this last name correctly, but hopefully I do. So it's Andrew Shalel, S H L E L, with Help Systems. So, Andrew, congratulations. You've won the second $500 Amazon gift card. Tracy will be in touch with getting that to you. And thank you, everybody, so much for joining us today. Joey, thank you again for being with us. Thank you again with Nutanix. Everybody, you can just take a minute, download that resource, go to visit Nutanix website. We really do thank them for underwriting this and supporting the community by allowing us to have this done that we couldn't do without them. So thank you. And um, with that, oh, and be sure to follow Joey at Jay Danton, and I'm sure he'll put some links there to his blog and to his writings on Redmond Mag. And with that, I'll throw it back to Tracy. Thank you. Great presentation, Joey. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Becky, for moderating that event, uh, that session of today's event. We really appreciate that, too. And it was a really great way to close out our event. So we really appreciate you taking your time out to be with us um, at today's Enterprise Cloud Data Summit. I'd also like to thank Nutanix, our sponsor. I think Becky provided a lot of information about them, and as she said, there are resources on the console that you can take a look at, so we really encourage you to do that. And finally, we'd like to thank the audience, and we really appreciate you staying on the whole time today. And uh, one final thing, when you exit, a short survey will pop up. We'd love to hear your thoughts about today's summit, and we encourage everyone um, to provide us your ratings and comments. So once again, thank you to our sponsor, to our speakers, to the audience, and enjoy the rest of your day. This concludes today's summit. Mm -hmm.